Good morning, church. So glad to be worshiping with you this morning. Hey, look up on your screen. We're all going to confess this together. Remember the Lord. Let's do that now. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That's good news this morning. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Hope does not disappoint. Just encourage you this morning. Put your hope in the Lord. Fix your eyes to him. If you have questions, if your heart's troubled, just look to the Father right now. Lord, we just lift our hands. We lift our hearts to you. 
we lift our eyes to you and we just say, you're where our help comes from. What we're about to sing is true, God. Give us vision to see like you do, wisdom like you have, God. Thankful that when Solomon asked for wisdom, you said you would give it to him. So we ask for that, that same prayer this morning. Give us wisdom. We love you in Jesus' name.
that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the Christ, my living hope. 
We just bring you as best we can this morning, our hearts. Bring hearts of worship before you, Jesus. Not perfect, not trying to be perfect, not trying to be all put together, God. We just lay our hearts before you and say, we're here with you, Jesus. That's what we want. We just want to be with you. Pray that, God, we would choose the portion that Mary chose and just to sit at your feet not just get busy doing a bunch of different things for you or to you God but we would just remember that ultimately we're called to just be with you being with you makes us like you changes us from the inside out this morning thankful for the time of worship that we just had Jesus may your presence fill us the rest of the day and as we get into the word this morning in Jesus name amen good morning renewal church it's so good to be with you today I really really wish we could be together in the same room but uh, we're gonna play it safe continue to wait a little bit longer and uh, pray that uh, as soon as possible as soon as humanly possible as soon as divinely possible, we can come together and worship again. Uh, in the meantime, what we're going to be doing is switching gears as we've done the last several weeks and having some conversations. And 
Um, I know that the conversation, the subject of racial reconciliation is polarizing. I know that it brings up a lot of feelings. And uh, I wanna make something really clear to all of you folks out there who are watching this, that this is not in any way intended to bully someone, to, uh, to condemn anyone, to shame anyone. The name of the game for us is transformation. Mm -hmm. It is about living out our calling in Jesus, which is to be conformed into his image. And when I look at scripture, I see a clarion call towards gentleness, tenderness, humility, intellectual honesty. Um, I see a call to bend the posture of our heart to one that is serving. I think about Jesus in the, the night that he was betrayed when he had his last supper with his disciples and he girded himself with a towel and he served his disciples. He washed their feet. Mm -hmm. And this is the posture that I'm trying to call us to. We see so many people in the media who are raging, who are angry. And I, I really believe that underneath all of that rage and anger is a deep anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's this uh, fear that the world is not the way we want it to be. And we're afraid to grasp the realization that there's nothing we can do. We are powerless to change it. That's not to say that God has not put us here to have a redemptive influence, but we are powerless to fix and change this world. And once we grasp that and just admit that, then we can push back from our anxiety and we can, with tender hearts, and with curious ears and open hearts, engage one another and work through some of the things that are causing so many people to function and act like opponents and enemies, mm -hmm. uh, even people sadly within the church. Mm -hmm. And so that's what our goal is today. Um, and so that's why I invited my very dear friend, Jazzy, to be with us today. Jazzy, mm -hmm. you are one of my favorite people in the world. You're uh, my favorite, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad we get to talk today. We've had some really sure. great conversations so far yeah. uh, with the Savages last week as a Caucasian mm -hmm. couple yeah. learning how to navigate these waters and how to, how to live out what it looks like mm -hmm. to speak for those who have historically in our country not been spoken for. Yeah. And then the week before, uh, with Zach and Elizabeth Wiggs and mm -hmm. them telling their story as a racially mixed couple yeah. and some of the things that they've faced in their lives. And so rather mm -hmm. than doing what I've done the last couple of weeks and starting off with me preaching, I wanted mm -hmm. you to mm -hmm. open up with a word today yeah. and encourage our congregation. So I'm just going to go mm -hmm. ahead and give it to you. Well, thank you because I've got one. I hey, think before I've you do that, you. I'm sorry, would you tell us about yourself just yeah, for a moment for those, yeah, yeah. Of, those, those folks out there who don't know you as well as, the, as we do? Yeah. So my name is Jazzy Miller. I, uh, I'm the director of theater at the Crosstown Theater mm -hmm. at Crosstown Concourse. I also teach theater part-time at Rhodes College. Um, I'm Scorpio. I love coffee um, and all things watercolor paints. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and um, I'm just, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I've been waiting for this moment in the church to share my heart, to listen to others share their hearts um, on this subject. So um, honored. If honored. I could just say, uh, one of the things I love about, about Jazzy is mm -hmm. I love her. There is a distinctive holiness about her life. No. Um, she loves Jesus. Mm. And you are sensitive to the Holy Spirit in mm. ways that I admire. Mm. And so Man. I just want to say I'm so honored for you to be here and share this stage with me. Oh, and so God. share what's on your heart this yeah. morning. And let's yeah. see what God wants to do. I, you know... I feel that if there's a scripture that I just live and breathe that I, that I wake up thinking about, it's this one. Mm. Um, it's John 17. Mm. It's the entire passage, but specifically verses 20 through 25 for today, okay. and I'd love to read them. Please. Um, but in verses 1 through 19, you've got Jesus um, on the night that he's betrayed, praying for himself, praying for his disciples. And in these verses, praying for all believers, praying for me, mm. praying for you, praying for all believers, yeah. you know, um, our, through our church time. through all time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so it begins this way. Um, Jesus says, 
I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Mm. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be, become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me, loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. Mm. And this passage, I mean, he's talking about, so before the foundation of the world, um, the Father knew him. Um, mm. uh, he's praying for believers to come. He's, he's um, highlighting the fact that, Father, you are in me uh, at the present moment, and I am in you. He is defying all time. Mm. This is future, present, past. Um, he's just wrapping it all into one in this moment. And then the most repeated thing in this, in this passage, that they may be yes. one. You and I, Father, are one. He's talking about oneness. Um, and I'm so encouraged by this because this is Jesus' prayer for the church. Mm. And no matter what we might go through, no matter what I'm feeling, no matter what traumas we experience, um, what will it take to, to, for this prayer to be answered? Yeah. That the Messiah prayed over me. Mm over you, over the church. Um, there is no, I'm convinced there's no height, no depth, no, um, there's, there's nothing. There's, there should be nothing to, to, to prevent us from being one. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm very encouraged by this passage. Yeah. And this time, no matter how hard things get, how angry I get, and how much I want to move and drift away, because sometimes that it, it feels like that can be, it's comfortable. Let me gravitate towards all the people who look like me and let's be mad together. Um, yep. uh, Jesus didn't pray for that. That's right. He didn't ask for that. Yeah. He asked for people of all, of all nations. Um, God, has, God has given him those people um, as an inheritance. We don't look the same. We don't have the same experiences, uh, but we got to figure this thing out together because yeah. he prayed for us to be one. It brings the question, what is it, what is one, what does it mean to be one? Yeah. As Jesus and the Father are one, they are, mm -hmm. theologically, we would say they are one substance. They yeah. share the same substance. They are one. Mm -hmm. um, we don't necessarily share the same substance. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there, I'm sitting here, and yeah. you didn't come from me, and I didn't come from you, yeah. and yet Jesus is praying that the same spiritual reality that defines his relationship with God, mm -hmm. that it would be true of us. Yeah. Even, like you said, even people who have opposing views on things. Yeah. That's profound to think about that. It is. To, and, and then to live into that. Yeah. And what that requires. And I think, pardon my preaching here, Jazzy. Um, Please. <laughs> Please, your occupation. I'm thinking about Jesus's submission to the father yeah he is god jesus yeah. existed before time he was mm -hmm. not created and That's yet right. he willingly submits to the father and mm -hmm. so you see that humility yeah lived out there yeah and i've got to think that that says something about what us being one mm -hmm. is what that what that is yeah yeah because there's a now there's a, a counterfeit right mm. um there's a counterfeit out there because i've experienced it uh, racial reconciliation those are kind of um those are the buzzwords of the time. Right. Um, it's not. It's it's not rebellious to say yes. We are racially reconciling. It's it's kind of a thing now. Um, but I've been in those rooms where, with people, and you know, we might be thirty thirty percent black, seventy percent white. Um, if we're just doing two races here sure. and we're singing Kumbaya and we're getting along until something, until somebody says something sideways. And there's that moment where you're like, 
okay, do I want to rock the boat and destroy the en the energy of the room right, right. and press in and ask, well, what do you mean by that? Can we talk about that for a second? Um, I can do that. And we're left to wherever the conversation goes. Um, or I can be silent. I can sit on it. And I can smile. Protect the peace. I can protect the peace. And we can look one way, but in my heart, I'm not with you. I've been there. And you've been damaged by that. Oh, yeah. Big I, time. I have to admit, I've, there have been times mm -hmm. when someone has made a comment that was inappropriate or mm -hmm. jaded racially. Yeah. Um, and I have to admit, there have been times that, that I, I protected the peace. Yeah. I, rather than make waves, it mm -hmm. was, and, and, and I felt so conflicted too, rather than mm -hmm. embarrass the few or the one yeah. African American who was there. And, and I just, I didn't know what to do. I felt mm -hmm. so ill, ill-equipped yeah. to be in a situation like that. Yeah. And I think we all feel that way to some degree. Mm -hmm. And we talk about racial reconciliation, like you just said, but mm -hmm. it's, it has this sort of amorphous, vague, mm -hmm. what does it even mean to what be racially reconciled? And as long as it's that way, we can, mm -hmm. there's no responsibility to do anything mm -hmm. because we don't know what it looks like to do something. Right, right. And even when we are, I, because I think that it requires like some quality of bravery yeah. of like stepping over that threshold that people, you know, people mm -hmm. rarely do. The thing that Jesus consistently did, you know, look, look at a meeting with those tax collectors and sinners. What's he doing? You know, um, he was constantly pushing, yes, he was. pushing that barrier. And so sometimes it's as, it's as simple as, I mean, this happened once at a community group, not here, but um, uh, where, you know, there's a bunch of us sitting in the room and I happen to be the only black person and we're talking about dancing or, you know, a, a group over here is talking about dancing, a group over here is talking about school, my group's talking about a different thing and uh, one of the groups talking about dancing, someone says, uh, yeah, I bet you know how to do all of them. And like, I looked up and looked over my shoulder and realized, oh, she's talking to me. Um, and I thought, let me, let me just, let me do the brave thing. Yeah, so-and-so, what do you mean by that? Hmm. Why, why do you think that I would know, that I would know how to do all of the dances? And it was a record scratch in the room. <laughs> it got awkward. <laughs> I mean, you got 50 people who just Everything <laughs> hesitate, <stops. laughs> you know, drinking their lemonade. Everything just stops. Um, we want to avoid that moment. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that we should do that anymore. We want to avoid that, even if that requires me walking over and putting my arm around her saying, hey, I love you. I love you. And I don't want to be quiet and sit on that if I've got the question in my mind. Yeah. So I'm just asking you, and you, you know, if you don't have the answer right now, that's okay. Mm. Being brave and leaning in it is hard to do because you don't know what 50 people are thinking yeah. in one room. Yeah. Who it's yeah. going to make uncomfortable. And if we are going to have a discipling culture, mm -hmm. it's important to be able to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, too often, I think, decorum um, supersedes discipleship. That's right. Protect the mood, protect mm -hmm. the vibe, protect mm -hmm. the brand. Yeah. Um, and, and I really like the way you're saying this because we're not, we're not proposing, I don't think, um, a brash confrontational spirit. We're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, that was a stereotypical and unfair thing to say Yeah. that put a spotlight on one person in a big group of people mm -hmm. that could wound people. Yeah. And I've seen that happen in other ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, on, in, on, in yeah. entirely different subjects, right, you right. know, and mm -hmm. it was appropriate to pull that person aside and say, hey, you know, that, that could have hurt that person. Maybe yeah. you should go and address that with them and own that, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. So yeah. we're talking about learning how to love well. Yeah. Learning how to love well. Learning how to, and it's hard. And, and minorities, mm -hmm. be it racially or any other 
way, mm -hmm. not feeling like they just have to s absorb it. That's right. Absorb it. Right. And suppress it. Yeah, that was the word I was looking for, absorb. Mm -hmm. Can I, should I press in and lean and do the brave thing or just be silent yeah. and absorb it? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. That's the word. Thank you. I like words. Yeah, you're good at them. <laughs> you're good at them. Um, I'm thinking about what Jesus says as we move from J John 17 into some, of my, uh, some other mm -hmm. conversation here on race and yeah. your experiences. I'm thinking about what, John, what Jesus says here in this text that we are one. Mm -hmm. He's speaking of his father. I want my people to be one. Mm -hmm. And he says, so that the world will know yeah. that God, Father, you sent me. Yeah. We would, that we would be one so that the world will know mm -hmm. that Jesus is legit yeah. in the eyes of the world. And I can't help but, you know, I know I hammer on this all the time, but this mm -hmm. is so common in our world. Mm -hmm. I look at social media and the way people dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, well, dialogue would be an overstatement, but yeah. the way people um, shoot at each other um, mm -hmm. and um, tag each other mm -hmm. and ridicule each other and malign mm -hmm. each other. And sadly, so many Christians do this as well. And I kept yeah. thinking as I was reading this, even today preparing for our conversation, mm -hmm. I kept thinking about how that's really the vision of our church. The vision of our church is that we would be a community yeah. filled with all kinds of people mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. to love one another. Mm -hmm. And as we learn how to love one another, it's through our growing love, our imperfect mm -hmm. love, yes, but our growing love mm -hmm. that Jesus is impossible to ignore. Mm -hmm. I know that's a mouthful and some people kind of snicker at that, but mm -hmm. that's really who we are when you cut us. Mm -hmm. It's what it's aspirationally, we really, mm -hmm. we deeply desire this. Yeah. And I know that you're not going in this direction, but that is what kept me here. Mm. I mean, other than the Holy Spirit, you know, you ask the Lord, you're just like, could they, to say yes, is this the place you want me to plant down? But um, it was like, this tastes different. Yeah. This smells different. This feels different. Um, not a single person sitting around me looks the same, first of all, you know. Um, but but you, you can, I, I could sense that oneness mm. and there's something so genuine and so sweet about it. And I just, I wanted to be, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah. It is my dream for our church. Yeah. It is my dream that we learn how to love one another well. Mm -hmm. And I would take that before big crowds, big yeah. budgets. Um, that's what makes me happy when I fall asleep at night. Yeah. And yet the irony is, is that in order to have that kind of a culture, we have to have hard conversations mm -hmm. or challenging conversations, mm -hmm. which is why we're doing this. Yeah. Um, and so if we're going to learn how to love one another, I've got to learn what hurts you. And you've got to learn what hurts me. That's right. And I've got to learn what affirms you yeah. and strengthens you. Mm -hmm. And you've got to learn that about me. And we have to learn that about each other, guys. We, this is what, you know, when Paul says in Ephesians 4, mm -hmm. he talks about the body of Christ mm -hmm. and how we are called to minister to one another. And if, yeah. in Ephesians 4, verses like, uh, if you start at 11 and read through 16, mm -hmm. he speaks of us learning how to serve one another and edify one another. Mm -hmm. We learn that. Yeah. Um, and so I want to move on to some more conversation on race mm -hmm. uh, explicitly here. Yeah. And particularly your experiences, Jazzy. Um, yeah. Tell us about growing up in the South. You have deep roots here. Yes. Um, born and raised. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So born and raised, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, uh, both my parents, you know, they, they met in med school. They moved here. They had my brother. Then they had me. Um, loving family, you know, God fearing family. We, uh, we went to a church in Whitehaven called Middle Baptist Church. They practiced two miles around the corner from that church. We lived a mile down the street from that church. Mm. We did life, um, right there in the Whitehaven community and life was just sweet. You know, um, I started swimming swim team when I was four at the Davis YMCA. Um, this is a all black team, you know, um, because by then the community was predominantly mm -hmm. African American. And so, um, so life was just sweet. You know, I heard all the things that all kids hear, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. 
Um, you can, you know, just set your mind to it, all the things. And, um, you know, love watching TV. You know, I know some of you out there, fans of Rugrats. Personally, I love the Rugrats. <laughs> you know, that was my Saturday morning show. Right. And you just, like, you don't notice it at first at like five or six but you know you got like tommy chucky phil lil uh the, the angelica the dream team they're all like you know they're all white kids but you love them because that's your show and they're getting into stuff together and figuring it out together and and then like susie comes on the scene and you're like a sister like in a cartoon she looks like me i look like her you know you start picking out these little details but mm. it doesn't it's your show it doesn't mean Do it's not good that or... having a visceral effect on you as no, a young child no just okay. no visceral effect just you know cartoons okay. cool and then like watch out you got Doug Doug funny the show Doug i don't know if many of you are familiar with that but um on Doug you know everybody's a different color like uh, Roger he's green <laughs> and like by the time I started watching that show, it's probably like in the third or fourth grade. So, you know, maybe there was some like trying to discern if that purple character were a race, what character would he be? Okay, so Ske so Skeeter does hip hop. Like, okay, he's probably the black kid. That's Doug's best friend, you know. Um, but without a doubt, the protagonist, the leading character, is Doug Funny, and he's white. You know, nothing visceral. It's just. This is what the show is, you know. Um, I start getting it, getting into swimming like more competitively, um, so that means going to the USS teams. USS back then now it's USA Swimming, um, and would often find in swim meets of thousands of people that sometimes I was the only black, the only black girl, the only black person at the meets if my parents didn't go, and so you know the wheels start turning. Occasionally you'll get a funny look. That doesn't mean that the person's looking at you because you're black at an all white swim meet. It just, um, they could be looking at what color swim cap you've got on. Mm -hmm. But without a doubt, being the only black one in the room um, starts to really become a reality that you, that you start getting used to when you're getting into the upper like levels of competition in swimming. And then you start hearing things like, oh, Margo, she's the fast girl. Um, then you hear, oh, Jazzy, she's the fast black girl. Mm. And you're like, oh, I'm a girl too. I guess I'm a black one. I mean, I know I'm black, but, you know, you start to hear those little distinctions. And then you're sitting in sixth period history class and you're going through your presidents. You mm. know, Washington, Adams, Jeff Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler. Wait a minute. I'm starting to notice a trend here, you yeah. know? Like, uh, I'm starting to notice. And you're asking your history teacher about what's in your history book and what's not there. Um, and met with that awkward silence of the class. Why is she asking that question? You know, what's that mean? Um, and gradually, you start to figure out and learn that there is a main course, there's a main subject in society. People may not outright say that, but you feel it, especially when your ethnicity feels like the elective, mm. feels like uh, the sidekick. Um, now, that is nothing like loving parents aren't teaching you that in the household. My parents didn't teach me that. Um, but when I left those doors and I went to, you know, Houston High School and um, out in Germantown, and then I go to swim practice, and I'm in Beta Club and the National Honor Society, and I'm looking around at what people look like, and I, and I see that I am the minority. And people, um, without meaning to, um, have ways of underscoring that. Oh, you know, uh, so-and-so is the pretty girl, but Courtney, she's the pretty black girl. Like, so-and-so, he's the, he's the, I don't know, the smart guy. Uh, but so-and-so, he's the black, smart, intelligent guy. Um, you start hearing that. And, it, and that distinction alone, you, you start to feel adrift. Mm -hmm. That this is the way we say things are, but this is how things really are. Mm. Um, remember once uh, when I was a kid, my mom got pulled over 
by the cops. Um, this wasn't the story that I was going to tell, but I'm just going to jump in, just lightly kind of glaze over it. But it, um, I was eight years old, and rainy day coming home from a swim meet. Um, I've got on a swimsuit still under my clothes. It's like common practice. You like if you're going straight home, just throw, throw your you know your parka on and just get to the house. Um, it's February. It's cold. It's the day before her tag's going to expire. She got pulled over by a cop um, who, you know, essentially tells her, your tag's about to expire. And she says, yeah, I know. I've, I've got a, another one in my glove compartment. I'm going to put it on when I get home. He says, well, if, if you let me see it, I'll let you go. Um, she gets it out. He goes back to his car. Um, and he comes back with the ticket. And she's like, hold, hold on. Like, what's the ticket for? The tag hasn't expired. And he says, sign the ticket, ma'am. And she says, I'm not signing that ticket. You know, the tag isn't expired. I just, I want to understand. Like, five minutes flat, all these squad cars come pull up. Um, and he tells her, step out of the car, ma'am. And my mother's like, I'm not stepping out of the car. I, I don't understand mm -hmm. what's going on, you know? And he says, well, if you don't step out of the car, I'm gonna take you out by force. Um, which then, you know, dominoes into my mom gets arrested. I'm put into the back of another cop car. Um, they're telling me that they're going to take me to juvenile court. Were you in, in a different car than she was? I was in a different car than at she eight years was old. at eight years old. Like, we're going to take you to juvenile court. Um, DCS will come and pick you up. Now, like, we, I mean, I have a loving family. I have a dad at home who has no idea this is going on. Countless aunts and uncles, a huge community that surrounds us, and DCS is going to come pick me up from juvenile court. I mean, it's just, it's preposterous. In fact, it was so preposterous, um, one of the cops present, I think, just picked up that something was very wrong. Um, and. And I don't know a lot about the rules, but I know that you can't interrupt maybe another arrest that's going on. Maybe the captain can do that. So I know that the captain was secretly called. So the captain showed up, like, f threw a fit to what's going on, you know, uncuffed that lady. The, uh, why would you put me in a position to do this much paperwork? So it's like, again, you're re-traumatized day, you're you know, great swim meet, you're going home to have dinner with your family. Fifteen minutes later, you're in the back of a cop car at eight years old. My mom, who's done nothing wrong, she's in the back of a cop car um, for, for no reason, you know? Um, and a captain who makes it all right by saying, sorry, mistake. How dare you, officer? I don't want to do all that paperwork. Yeah. And it's a day. You know, so by the time you become an adult, you've learned the world is a, is a difficult place for me. I've got to be careful. I've got to keep my friends close, mm -hmm. my enemies closer. Um, I've got to, you start like, you start just priming yourself for incidents like this because you know they're gonna come straight at you. Um, and most of all, you know, it, it, there's like a, there's a knowing that everything that is done, it's done so silently and in secret. Mm. Um, it just feels like a life of tainted secrecy, just walking with this, this race issue um, that you can never talk about or bring up without offending people. Um, and I guess that's the, the, the sad irony for me, mm -hmm. as, I, as I see it, is mm -hmm. you, you are one of many many African Americans mm -hmm. that I've heard stories like this from. Yeah. Um, this is, I would, I, I consider this common. Mm -hmm. I've heard so many stories. Yeah. That it's, to me, the evidence is irrefutable. Yeah. And yet, because the subject itself is polarizing, mm -hmm. you feel put in a position where you've got to make sure nobody's feathers are ruffled. That's right. And yet you're carrying this, this tension, this anxiety. Yeah. Always looking over your shoulder, making sure that mm -hmm. your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted, and, mm -hmm. and just to make sure that mm -hmm. things are cool. Yeah. Yeah. And the kinds of stories that I hear 
I know this has happened to white people and people mm -hmm. of other races. I, that's happened yeah, as well. That's right. But the rate at which it has happened in the black community is, mm -hmm. again, it's just mm -hmm. irrefutable. And so I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sad that you feel that that music's always playing in the background. I'm sad you have to carry yeah. that around. Yeah. Truly. It's, and it's, it's hard. And I'll tell you, you know, by the time I made it to college, that it was that was with me, but there was still an innocence that you know you're going off to college. You're about to become. You're becoming a woman. You're going to find that career that you love. Um, the world's not over yet. Your journey's just beginning. Um, but what you don't know is you're stepping out from under that safety net that your parents have made for you. So even the incident with the cop, um, it was terrible. But I had a witness. I had a witness in my mom, mm. um, and somehow a witness in that one cop who yeah. saw this unjustly being done and called the captain. Um, there were witnesses, trauma traumatizing, mm. but someone, some, we saw each other. You told me a story about an experience you had where you didn't feel yes. you had a witness, where you were mm -hmm. invisible. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, it happened when I was in college. So. Um, you know, and college swim team at that. So swim team, t those are the people that you're going to be around, team uh, of any sort, that those people you're going to be around more than you are your own family. Mm -hmm. um, you wake up and you swim together. Um, if you're in training week, you have a midday swim together mm -hmm. for a couple of hours, and then you have an evening swim together. Every day, that's how it goes. So if I'm hearing you, the assumption is mm -hmm. the great deal of time you're spending together mm -hmm. should lead to some intimacy, deep form that's right. forming a friendship. That's right. You know me. I know you. You know it makes me tick. You know my favorite color. Um, if you're going to go in the gas station when we're driving to swim meet, grab me some that's right, some Skittles you already <laughs> knew. I mean, we just, we know each other. We do so much like who you want to sit with, who you don't want, who you don't need to sit with because you know they're going to fall asleep and stick their foot in your face. I mean, just, we're like siblings, you know, you, you, you know each other, you get each other. Um, and well into that experience, uh, one night coming home from a swim meet, um, there's a guy on the bus and, you know, he, he was a year younger than I was and um, got back on the bus and he's sitting, he's sitting in my seat. I'm like, oh, come on, so-and-so, you got, you got to get up. You got to get out of my seat. You know, I like that seat. And he's like, I'm not getting out of your seat. You know, you know, I like this seat. And so we're going, we're bantering, we're having fun. And then it started to get like, maybe it started to get a little like thorny um, because when I recognized he wasn't going to get up um, and when he recognized that I wasn't going to let up, and then by that time, everyone had gotten back onto the bus and everyone's kind of listening and they're chiming in, oh, y'all stop arguing, da, 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 da. And then he points a finger at me and he says, shut up, slave. And in that moment, record scratch, everybody got silent. I was like trying to, you know, I was so shocked just telling myself, did I hear what I think I just heard? Um, I think that he may have been shocked um, and just nobody moved for what felt like a lifetime, probably a couple seconds, but felt like a lifetime. And I said, excuse me, what did you say to me? And when I said that- Called out the injustice. When I called out the injustice, that broke the silence for what I would call the other participants on the bus. They would go, oh, come on, you know that he was just kidding. Why are you taking such offense to, you know that he really didn't mean anything bad by that. Why don't you, you're destroying the mood. And so now, you know, it's gone from one to like eight people out of 26 people on the bus who are openly um, speaking against me calling out what just happened. Mm. Um, and for, you know, and everybody else on the bus, they're just silent. They're just silently watching. And in that moment, um, there's 26 of us, um, including a coach. Everyone's white. Um, this did not end well, of course. Of course, I wasn't cool with it. Um, they didn't fess up to it. In fact, they excluded me. They called me names um, that were 
just as, if not more hurtful than what he'd said. And the coach says, well, why don't you just come to the front of the bus, Jazzy, and just, just ride the rest. So now I've lost my seat. I can't even have my seat back, you know. Um, and I'm sitting at the front of the bus, of an all-white bus, which is oddly feels like the back of the bus. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, I'm just like crying, I'm torn up, I'm, I'm just hurting, just bleeding, you know? Um, and, uh, and it's, yeah, I can't get this, this thing out of my mind. The thing that I thought about the whole way home was 50, 60 years ago, this same setup happened. There were 26 people somewhere in the world. 25 of them were white, and one of them were black. One of them was black, and they were maybe in the woods somewhere. And a lynching happened. And there were a handful of participants, and there were others who were there who were silent. And I, I'll bet your bottom dollar wow. that those silent people did not feel guilty because they didn't get their hands dirty, but they watched. And so the thing that I walk away from that and still today struggle with is the silence. And that's one thing that we hear a lot today. Silence is violence, silence is violence. Um, if we're not participating in protests or if we're not doing something about the wrong being done. And I think the heart behind that is, if you see a wrong being done, if you see an injustice and you are present to watch that, to see that, and you have, and you have it within your power to speak up and to say something, you should say something. You should say something. That night I felt completely and mm. utterly alone um, in, a, in a room on a bus full of my teammates who were supposed to be my family. They're supposed to be there. Um, and they weren't. Mm. And so... Um, I can't ima imagine the shock that must have felt like being that you've spent all this time together. Mm -hmm. You had the assumption that these yeah. were your people. Yeah. And then you found out in a moment like that Yeah. they didn't have your back. That they didn't have my back. And as mm -hmm. the majority, and this isn't just an anti-white S mm -hmm. statement here, mm -hmm. but this is when it, wherever a majority exists, uh -huh. the majority often, sometimes unbeknownst to them, they don't, they don't see it. I think there's some blindness there at times, mm -hmm. but the majority often will shame a person who's been wounded yeah. by discounting their pain. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't feel it that deeply. Yeah. It shouldn't hurt you like that. Yeah. Well, that's easy when you've not, you've not been hurt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's yeah. a... Yeah. Tragic irony that you found yourself at the front of the bus. Uh, I, I mean, heard that before you even said it. And even like, you know, I'm thinking now, I remember, because uh, it was a long trip, when people had fallen asleep, because I never slept that night, but there was a slow trickle of an occasional person who would walk to the front and they didn't say, I'm so sorry for what happened. They didn't say, um, they didn't say what, what, what happened was wrong. Um, they said, I'm just checking on you. How are you feeling? And still, even in that, it's, it's the secrecy of it. It was done publicly. And we wait until everyone goes to sleep to walk yeah. to this girl at the front of the bus to see how she's doing. Um, not even to affirm that I, I saw what I saw. I think that people, um, that women who have experienced um, sexual violence feel similarly. Mm. Um, that night, it could have been a girl on the bus with, a, with guys in the same fraternity. And something could have been said sideways to her. She would have felt the same weight of pain that I felt that night on the bus. Um, it's just, it's a, what a world we live in. What a wow. world we live in. Um. I think there's something to, something big to saying what the injustice is. Yeah. Naming it. Naming it, confessing it. Yeah. The scriptures speak of healing that takes place mm -hmm. when there's a confession, when there's a, let's name it. Mm -hmm. 
let's not let it remain in the shadows and yeah. be ambiguous about it. Yeah. But let's name it mm -hmm. for the purpose of restoration. Yeah. Not to beat somebody down or humiliate someone, mm -hmm. but for the purpose of restoration. Yeah. And of course, mm -hmm. naming it doesn't mean that the person who committed it will humble themselves. That's right. They may. That's right. They may lean in with some more pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I and and I, and I think also I think that if you're a witness to something, this is my opinion now. But I think that if you're a witness to something, you are accountable. Yes. So. Um, it's interesting. I visited a charter school a few years ago um, after school. We had a theater program, and we would go and get kids and, um, and bring them to the concourse building. It's the most fascinating thing after school one day. I saw, like, it must have been like 40 kids running in one direction with their hands in the air going, I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm not participating. I'm not there. I'm not there. And I'm like, what's going on? And then like maybe 50 kids running in the opposite direction. Um, some of them getting their phones out. And I just looked over at the nearest teacher. I was like, what's going on? And she's like, oh, a fight's about to happen. And I'm like, how did you know that? You know, because it was such a striking visual of all these kids, like exodus in like two yeah. different directions. And she said, because we now have a policy that if a fight breaks out between two kids, if you are not only there caught filming it, but if you are caught there, it's an automatic suspension. And so the kids running away from the fight were making it known, I am not a part of this. I'm not with this. I am not there. And the kids running in that direction um, were openly declaring, but I want in on this. Um, and so it wasn't until they held the group accountable um, hmm. for their actions, for whatever choice they were going to make in that moment, did they see some real change in behavior. If you're there, if you're going to, and I know that oftentimes we don't choose to be a witness to these things. Um, we, we rarely, I know these days, choose to watch an injustice being done, but it's being done so frequently. I think it's, I think it might be safe to say all of us, even if we're in the car with a friend driving to Florida and that, fr that friend says something off, um, you've heard it. You're now a witness. Now, what will be your choice to remain silent? absorb that or are you going to speak into it mm. and to help stimulate um, that person's conscience and yeah. train that person to yeah to think differently yeah to behave differently yeah that's right so that other people aren't wounded that's right we have a responsibility and, and for me jazzy this all comes back to living for the common good bringing shalom yeah to our world which is what every human is commissioned to do yeah um, and then you take it to another level as mm -hmm. followers of Jesus, mm -hmm. and we're to bring the gospel. Yeah. We're to the bring good the news. good news of Jesus, resurrection life where there's death. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. this is a lot. Yeah. This conversation went by really fast. Yeah, it did. We've been talking is for it two up hours. Already? I'm kidding. I'm joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, um, before we do the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited to take that with you today. Yeah, me um, too. Is there anything that you would like to say? I know we talked about maybe returning to John 17. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like, that you think is appropriate to conclude with? Yeah. Um, we've heard some stories. We've talked about the issue. Yeah. There's some, there's some takeaway here. Let's there speak is. where, when there's silence, let's speak. You yeah. know, we train our, we teach our children. Yeah. You know, if you see someone being bullied at school, mm -hmm. take up for the person, That's no right. matter what happens. Yeah. Take up for that person. Mm -hmm. We want you to defend mm -hmm. those who are being abused. Mm -hmm. Uh, the weak, mm -hmm. defend that person, speak yeah. for that person. Yeah, yeah. Personal responsibility. It is our individual responsibility. It's a, I, love, I love it when we're hearing the word go forth in church and you or Ron when you're up there teaching and, um, and it's sort of a, you know, repeat after me. Who is, who is God talking about in this passage? Me. The inclination is to go us. And sometimes it gets lost in the mm -hmm. us because it's like, we're all accountable. Yeah. Well, sure, that's true. But there's a, diff there's a shift when you say, 
I am accountable. I, Jazzy, am accountable. Um, and it and it does go back to this um, to this passage. Like I, you know, I love to visualize Jesus praying um, on the night that he was betrayed, mm. and his disciples there with him. Maybe some of them are listening. Maybe some of them are not. Maybe some of them are sleeping. I don't know what they're doing at that exact moment. Um, but what if you know we visualize the people that they are going to lead into the kingdom right behind them. Mm. They're with the people that they don't even know that they're going to lead yet, um, that they're going to lead to Christ. And the people that those people lead to Christ and the people that those people lead to, you go far enough down that line, I'm there. Yep. You're there. Um, All of our friends watching are there. All of our friends watching are there. All believers are there. And we are in that garden with Jesus. In that garden with Jesus, overhearing him pray this prayer to the Father, hearing him ask the Father for this oneness for us, that Mm. we would experience this the way that he experiences it. And when I think I am responsible, I think, Lord, no matter how much this hurts, no matter how traumatizing things have been in life, your prayer can't end with me. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, we're going to be one. And when it gets difficult, I'm going to lean in. And when I don't, please help me. Mm. Help me. Help us. And so it's it, that piece is taking that personal responsibility to be brave and to maybe hear a story that is so unlike your own. Um, and to lean in even when it hurts. Um, I know that some of you may not know what it's like to grow up being a black child or, um, or Asian or, um, or Latino or, or whatever our respective backgrounds may be, but to just to listen, to be a little brave um, yeah. and to listen and to, um, and to be one with us. I wonder what would have happened if one person on that bus would have stood up and said, gang, this is not cool. Yeah. This is not acceptable. I probably wouldn't be telling the story. I probably wouldn't be telling the story Mm. if just one person stood up and said, this isn't right. I would have felt seen. I would have felt heard and known. Did you ever hear from that person who hurt you? I did. In fact, I did. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And how long ago did this happen? 13 years ago. And so the people that are saying, Jazzy, mm-hmm. be chill out. This mm-hmm. is not a big deal. Yep. 13 years later, he's been carrying around that mm-hmm. simple, harmless statement that he didn't mean mm-hmm. that drove him to send mm-hmm. you an email. Yeah. Yeah, I almost forgot about that. Good gracious. Thank you for bringing that up. Two weeks, le- two weeks ago, I got an email from him um, just saying, um, you know, I said some really hurtful things 13 years ago um, on the bus coming back from a swim meet, and I just wanted to let you know I'm changed, I'm living a different life now, and I'm aware of all that's going on, and it's stirring up old things for me, and I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. Um, and while I heard that, and while I'd like to f- believe that I forgave him 13 years ago, um, you know, I, I, I still, th- it, it brought up, it brought up frustrations for me, um, that are similar to what people are feeling right now with our systems. Mm. It is, the apology is good, but it is no substitute for justice because had justice been done, and the coach saw and reported what he saw happen on that bus that day. We all signed diversity contracts, just like we signed the, the honor contracts for the honor code. Um, you, you plagiarize, you're kicked out. Mm. You disregard the diversity contract, um, there are repercussions. Um, the school might not have thought enough um, to hold him accountable to the diversity contract. Uh, his advisor didn't, the department didn't, the coach didn't. None of the teammates did. Um, the entire system of the college essentially um, worked together to protect this individual. Um, and so I guess 
that makes me feel that, you know, um, even if justice were done and he were kicked out of the college, that apology still would have been necessary. Mm. One isn't a substitute for the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. But. These are heavy issues. Yeah, they are. Um, we're willing to go there. Yeah. At least I hope we are as a church. Yeah. I hope we're not giving in to a less virtuous mm -hmm. um, impulse to put this on the shelf and move on. Yeah. Um, virtue requires courage. Mm. Holiness requires courage. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here, being vulnerable. Thank you. Um, I think it'd be really appropriate for us to partake of the Lord's Supper together. For sure. To remember that a lot of blood was shed yeah. so that we could do this yeah. and live this out. Yeah. And so that our brothers and sisters watching can also live this out together. Yeah. Um, there's going to be tension. Mm -hmm. It's going to be thorny. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to always understand or agree, but we are one in Christ. Yeah. And as I said last week, it is not about winning. This is not about conquering. This is not about being the victors in a culture war. This is not about protecting our way of life. That's not who we are. Mm -hmm. We can try to protect our way of life and at the same time be enslaved to the flesh. Yeah. And I want to encourage all of us to relinquish control over the things that you have no control over mm -hmm. and rather live bravely, mm -hmm. live lovingly, and remember that we are crucified with Christ. We are crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. It's no longer we who live, yeah. but Christ who lives through us. And so let's adopt his posture. Yeah. Let's remember that Jazzy, the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. Yeah. And he was sitting at the table with his closest friends, people that he had shared life with very intimately, mm -hmm. people that wounded him with betrayal. Mm -hmm. We know the story of Judas, mm -hmm. but also Peter who denied Jesus, who was silent mm -hmm. when Jesus was being tortured. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you to take a piece. Yeah. Let's remember. Mm -hmm. Let's remember that all that Jesus endured, mm -hmm. all that he faced, mm -hmm. he moved toward us and took our sin, mm -hmm. our sorrows, our brokenness on himself. Jesus, thank you. We receive this bread, the body of Christ. When you think about the blood that washes away our sins, what do you think in regards to this bigger context of mm -hmm. racial reconciliation? Does anything come to mind? Mm. Totally putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. I know this sounds so cliche, but um, just purity, just a, a renewed purity between us. Um, yes just the washing away of mm. all of the things. I don't know where where mm. that, where the guy who said those things, where he really is, you know, from 13 years ago. But if, if he is a believer, he's my brother. Yes. Um, whether he's my brother or not, I love him. Um, and this moment reminds me, reminds me of that, that we get to share this, this shared purity. Um, mm together and um, like a catharsis it's a washing away of our jadedness yeah our yeah. cynicism yeah yeah the, the stories that we cling to that define and maybe even give rise to our bigotry yeah um yeah or the shame yeah and the shame that we feel from the things that we've done the things that we've said yeah um all of us you know i'm thankful that jesus's blood is moved us, moved us 
toward one another. And so, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Um, would you pray for our church today? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Dear Jesus, we just, um, we love you. And we cannot do this without you. Um, we thank you that you've modeled the way, that you've um, shown us what good and true and what perfect love is, um, and that that is who you are. Um, you modeled the perfect oneness with the Father. Um, you never stopped chasing after, never stopped loving your disciples. Um, such a good reminder, even when Peter was silent. Um, but you also... Um, you also made dinner that one last time, or breakfast that one last time over a charcoal fire, um, similar to um, the one that Peter warmed his hands over when he was denying you. Um, and so you see, um, you see the things that we that we struggle with in our hearts. Um, you see the the hard things, you see the shame, you see um, the sin, um, but you see the potential. Um, and your perfect love casts all that out. And we just thank you, Lord, for pulling us in and, um, and declaring and making us uh, righteous in your name and, uh, and for making us one. And we just pray that, Lord, we, um, that we would be that, that we would be the answer to your prayer. Yes, Lord. And that we would live that. And um, we love you. Yes, Lord. And we thank you. And it is in your perfect name that we pray. Amen. I can't help but wonder if there are folks watching this who have not yet embraced the way of Jesus, mm. who have not given their lives in surrender to Jesus and exchanged your ways for his ways. Mm -hmm. um, this is what we call being born again, born from above, um, being saved. But very simply said, it's embracing the ways of Jesus and allowing Jesus to be your rabbi, your teacher, your Lord, and to lead you in the way of the kingdom of God. And if that is you, and you want to know what that's like, how to do that, I beg you, please reach out to us. Please reach out to us. Um, email us. Give us a phone call. We want to show you how to live in the way of Jesus, how to follow the way of Jesus. Um, and you can see that email and phone number uh, in just a few minutes when we do the announcements. But uh, my friends, I love you. Uh, we are doing this not to polarize. I know this is polarizing for some folks. Mm -hmm. I get it. That's not our intent. Our intent is to call the body of Christ, but specifically the church we're involved in, Renewal Church, to live out our identity as Jesus people. And I really hope that we can do that together. We can drop our weapons we can let go of the anxiety and the anguish that we feel about the way things are going in our world. And there's a lot of stuff happening that's scary and frightening. And I get it. That's true. I feel those same things. But we don't have to obsess over that and be controlled by that. We can live what is the essence of the gospel. The just shall live by faith in Jesus. We can trust Jesus that no matter what is happening around us, that Jesus is sovereign over the universe and certainly over this world. We can trust him with our lives. So now we can live in rest and peace and joy. My friends, this is the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. But in order for you to, to, to experience that, there has to be a surrender to the way of Jesus. And I invite all of you, all of you, to surrender to the way of Jesus mm -hmm. and let us walk in Jesus as one together. We love you. God bless you. We hope you have a great week, and we are so eager to be back with you again.
God bless you. Hey, everybody, I'm really glad we got to worship together today and uh, be able to walk through some of these conversations and be able to root our conversations in the scriptures. Again, if any of you out there um, would like to know more about what it looks like to exchange your ways for the ways of Jesus, please reach out to us. Uh, You can contact us via email, uh, info at renewalmemphis.com. You can call us, 901-751-3333. Uh, We really hope you would reach out to us. Uh, We're here for you. We are praying for you. If you need anything from us, church, we love you and we want to walk with you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, If you'd like to stay updated on what's going on at our church as we continue to navigate through this uh, season of isolation and and separateness, um, uh, just go to our website. and At our website's homepage, RenewalMemphis.com, you can navigate to our newsletter, to uh, resources and tools for your children, for discipleship. You can get involved with a community there, one of our smaller groups, we call them communities, where you can experience um, relationship and get a little bit deeper in being, uh, being involved in our church. Also, if you would like to give, uh, continue to faithfully contribute to our church, we would really, really appreciate that. You can do that very simply through texting. You can text 84321. Also, you can give uh, online on our website. And for those of you who like to send your cash in the mail or send a check in the mail, you can do that as well. Just make that check out to Renewal Church and send that to P.O. Box 381964, Germantown, Tennessee, 38183. My friends, we love you. We are praying for you. And again, we cannot wait for the day that we get to worship together in person again. Until that time, we love you. God bless you.